So just a brief to start, I, I, I kept this pretty broad of an overview um, uh, with hopefully holding time to go into more detailed discussion as needed or wanted afterwards. Okay, so I haven't met a lot of you, so I thought I would just introduce myself. I am a first year PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I also did my bachelor's and my master's um, in mechanical engineering there. And part of the reason I stuck around for so long is that the last year of my bachelor's degree, I joined the nuclear and robotics group um, and really, really liked it. So I have continued with them and I'm, I'm currently um, doing my PhD with them. My, that PhD topic I'll talk about at the end, um, but it's, it's focusing on automated contact tasks. And I thought it'd be fun to throw in some fun stuff that I like to do, like hiking or camping around Austin and not during um, coronavirus times, I play on the, the UT men's club volleyball team. Okay, so my Google Summer of Code project had um, some, uh, the primary goal was to port Move It Jog Arm to us too. And then while doing that, I wanted to improve testing and documentation and then add some new features. Uh, briefly, I'll discuss um, Move It Servo, which the name change happened during my, uh, during the summer. So I'll just refer to it as Servo uh, throughout this presentation. Um, just in case people might not know what it is, it's an NFX or velocity controller. So it takes uh, a commanded velocity for the end effector and converts it into join angles and then it sends it to a robot so the robot can execute whatever the the user wants. Um, and I'll just note that it's a a inverse Jacobian method. Um, so this is like a first order approximation, uh, which is not the most advanced IK method, but it works surprisingly well for this um, because each time step that we're asking for is really, really small. So the, the linear approximation here is actually pretty good and it works, it works really well. Uh, I'm not gonna play this whole video, but I just thought that this is an old video that I took a while ago. That this is servo being used with the, uh, with the VR hand controller. Uh, so this is, is just pretty fun video because I think it's cool. <laughs> All right. So this is actually whatever, move it jog arm and in ROS one. Okay, some of the cool features about servo are the flexible inputs. So that means that the input is really just a ROS twist message. So it can come from any device. It can come from like a gamepad or a the VR hand controller, voice commands, or even another node that's outputting twist commands. And then the frame, the the, the frame that that command is in doesn't matter as long as we can find a transform uh, to the to the robot frame. And then it also supports, in addition to the end effector velocity, it also supports just joint commands, which is really useful if you just want to like twist the end effector or I don't know, maybe move the whole arm from one quadrant to a different quadrant or something like that. Um, in addition to the actual IK math stuff, it also does collision checking and stops the robot before it hits itself or something else in the environment and enforces the joint positions, velocities and accelerations. And then when that Jacobian becomes singular and inverting it is uh, difficult, it, it slows down and stops. So we don't get crazy, move, crazy movement. I'm gonna show this slide uh, pretty frequently. This is just something I made during the summer, which is kind of like the ROS input and outputs of Servo. The main functionality is shown in red. And this is, this is like what the C++ API um, would use in their code and it's it's got two parts of collision checking and then where most of the action happens is where it's actually running the calculations and updating the robots data and all that stuff and then the blue um outer square here is um the naming convention from ross one is servo server but this is the composable node um interface that i made so this is this adds some ross functionality just like start and stop the servo Okay, so some of the challenges I faced uh, during the, the the primary goal, which was a porting uh, servo, uh, was like questioning what exactly should be a node in ROS2, dealing with composable nodes, and then understanding the new parameters and launch servers. And I'll discuss each one of these in, a, in some detail. So um, in ROS2, you can get, you can just create 
a node as a C++ object, or you can create a class that inherits from it. And I initially was struggling with what exactly I should create as nodes. Like, should I have one that encompasses everything or should each part be a smaller node? Um, but what I discovered is that basically creating a node inside of some other node, whether it's composable or not, uh, just gives you kind of troubles. And, and we've seen this since like with the planning scene monitor um, where you can get, you have to be careful or as you get weird naming conventions where like two, where you'll have two or more nodes that are named the same, even though when you created it, you said, hey, be this name. Um, if it's inside another node, it kind of just overwrites, I guess, your, 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 what you want it to be there. So eventually, um, I decided to kind of adopt the, the structure from ROS1 where uh, a node handle is passed around to the various subcomponents. When instead of a node handle, it's uh, just a shared pointer to the node. And this is, I think, is fairly standard practice in ROS2 from what I've seen in ROS2. So back to our little map here, that would just mean that this whole uh, blue outer square is as the component node uh, is actually just inherits from the node as a, as, as a base class. And then the shared pointer is passed into servo and then passed into servo calcs and collision checking. And then from there it goes into even into like the planning scene monitor. Um, okay, onto composable nodes, which Ross is, I guess they're pushing it to be like the the standard in Ross to, to, to try to write your code as composable nodes. Um, I think they're nice, uh, specifically for the user because it does some of the setup work automatically. Um, and then you can plug it into a larger project pretty easily, uh, hopefully as simply as just, uh, you know, adding it to your launch file. And then you can, you can put it into, so these composable nodes go into component containers. So you could put a bunch of different components into a single container. And, and there's a, just a, a flag in the launch file to enable inter-process communications um, between them. So that's nice. Some of the problems I encountered is that the constructor, need, the constructor of the composable node needs to be really fast and it needs to return quickly. Um, in ROS1, the, the servo constructor waits for um, a joint message, a joint states message, um, and then before it starts doing other initialization stuff. And that was causing lots of problems when I was trying to do this in ROS2 because um, I don't think you can specify the order that these nodes are launched in. And basically it would just wait forever and never get the joint message because it was, it was kind of blocking. So uh, basically I think it's nice if you could get your component node to, as soon as you launch it, it's starting, it's starting to do whatever it's, it's doing. It's spinning on startup, but I, I don't know how feasible that is for um, more complex um, nodes so that might require some heavy initialization. And so maybe you could look at doing lifecycle composable nodes there. Um, what I did is I just pushed the, the initialization to the first time somebody calls start. So they, if you launch the, the servo node, the servo server composable node, before you send any commands to it, you have to start the servo and that does the initialization. And then if you start and stop in the future, it, it, it skips it. Uh, the other challenges I faced were like the new parameter server, uh, sorry, the parameter server is gone. So the new parameter system and um, the launching system is, is Python based now. Uh, and both of those were a learning curve. And then specifically the parameters were um, kind of interesting because they're, they are loaded per node so inside of your, your software, whatever your, your node is, you have to declare a parameter as or before you get it. So back to our, our little map here is, is that the parameters are declared within the node and then I got pass the parameters deeper into the system. So this, this means that if you're doing servo with a, if you're using this as a the C++ API and, and doing the, kind of the setup manually, one of the setup steps you have to do is, is use a helper function in the server library to load the parameters. Um, on that note, uh, namespacing the parameters, uh, you should at least think about because if you're using the C++ API and you have like a gigantic node that's doing a bunch of stuff, um, 
you know, the servo parameters, maybe one of the servo parameters could have a name conflict with some other parameter a user is has loading by themselves. And then, you know, bad stuff happens. So namespaces. So that, that was kind of like my, my primary thrust was porting to, to ROS2. Um, just put this slide back up to show the secondary was improved in testing and documentation. I'm not really going to talk about the documentation. I made some little markdown files with the idea of getting somebody to be able to use Move It Servo on their ROS2 system quickly, but those systems aren't really ready for uh, ROS2 yet because like ROS, like they don't have the controllers to drive the robot. And then I'll talk about some added features that I did not really get around to, but we'll talk about it. So on the improved testing, I added integration tests, including just porting the kind of the start the servo, send some commands, stop the servo integration test from ROS1. But then I added some additional ones to check for collision to make sure that the robot was slowing down and not hitting itself. And then also, well, to make sure it's slowing down when it approached singularity. And then I think the more important tests were, I wrote unit tests on the, the core calculation part of the servo. Um, especially, especially since during the, the start of the summer, I, I spent some time looking through that code and found some, some bugs that would have been caught by the test that I wrote later. So that's good. Some of the challenges I talked, uh, some of the challenges for the testing, which I can go into more depth in a second, if you want is passing ROS parameters to the unit tests and then the whole testing, launch testing system and ROS2 was different. So that was another learning curve to, to figure out. Um, just to put that in explicit writing, is a, the integration test tests everything. And then I write unit test to test the, the core functionality. Some of the features that I also, I wanted to add to um, Servo was be able to change the IK as, in some kind of like plug-in fashion so that um, this math, you could change it um, specifically if you were near uh, Singularity and the Jacobian and you could you could try to do something to handle it better um, besides just slowing down and stopping, which is what Servo's default behavior is. And then I also wanted to add some functionality um, to get the Jacobian uh, kind of also in a plug-in fashion, get the Jacobian from somewhere else. So right now it's it's from a robot state in the move it core. And uh, I was hoping that splitting it out would allow somebody to servo with a non-serial robot. So if they had like a parallel robot or a robot with some linkages, um, some fancy linkages as joints, and they had a Jacobian method for it, if they could just substitute it in, then the rest of the, the package would work. I didn't get around to these too much. I started playing with the with the IK, um, but I left my research until the end because I I left it as future work for the Google Summer of Code project. But I think it's very likely that I'll be looking at those things this semester um, as as sort of my work for my lab. So some of the stuff I'm still interested in and working on um, is post tracking. Andy has an open PR for basically writing a wrapper around a servo. So you can send a pose and then a PID controller drives servo um, to that pose, uh, which I think is interesting for uh, if you're doing like contact tasks or, or some stuff with visual servoing or virtual fixtures, it could be useful for that. And then the singularity handling, I've started to play with this and I have videos of it in my backup slides, um, which I can show. Um, but I think doing this, especially on like a six degree freedom arm instead of a seven degree freedom arm is, will have a big impact on being able to use servo uh, more effectively. And then I just want to note that I'm back in my research lab and both of these things are being developed with, with ROS1 instead of ROS2 because I can test it on an actual robot. <laughs> I kind of alluded to these before. This is what I'm interested in in, in researching uh, specifically with Servo is that we've dabbled with force or impedance control in the past, where basically a robot arm has a force torque sensor and we apply, we apply some impedance control on it um, so that 
the arm reacts to the forces. But the output of this impedance law is just a, a velocity, a twist message. So I don't, I don't see a reason why we couldn't just feed that into servo, maybe alongside other user commands and, and get kind of a really fast and nice uh, impedance controller for an arm. And then my main research is, is contact tasks. And I, I'm curious about using servo to complete them because um, it's, it's quick and it's also uh, continuous in the joint space. So it doesn't reconfigure itself, which is important if you are uh, contacting the environment. And then the last thing is, is maybe setting up a simulation uh, with a robot arm running servo, doing tasks, and then applying machine learning to it and try to figure, try to learn uh, contact tasks automatically. And we'll just show this video. This is this is like an old video from our lab, but it's kind of the things that we're starting to do. This is all with servo uh, or move a jog arm. Um, to, to turn this valve. Awesome, I'll just wrap up by saying a uh, huge thanks to Tyler and Andy, my mentors for the Google Summer of Code, who also uh, routinely dealt with just absolutely wall, massive walls of text that I would drop in our Slack channel. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, I'll just let this video run and can take questions. So this is just a video that I I made to show kind of all the features of Servo. And this is it running in ROS2, but these features exist in ROS1 as well.